Greetings, perforator friends. So my search for the manual for this Remex um, RPS 6122 was not successful. Rob, Rob tries to fix a thing. Uh, I did a little bit of searching and I did find in this issue of Computer World from 1976 uh, an ad from Remex and it actually shows a picture of the thing that I have. And it's actually a perforator, not a, a tape punch. But anyway, so that's that. And uh, Remex was actually a subdivision of Excello Corporation, which as far as I can figure out, um, made machine tools. So this was primarily used to control uh, CNC, uh, as we would call, as they would call them at that point, NC for numerically controlled uh, machinery. And of course the N, the numbers, came from the tape. Um, and this is where you would uh, perforate the tape. Um, it says it's 120 characters per second, tape perforator, and this is specifically for the 6120 series. Uh, the right perforator configuration for mini computer, NC, test, and photo typesetting applications. So uh, this is uh, basically what I have. So I also found a manual online from BitSavers for this, which is a combination uh, reader and perforator. Uh, so I figured, well, why not? I'll just download it and see what I can find. So now the interesting thing is that this is the mechanism um, of their combination um, model. And interestingly, it looks extremely similar to the one that I have. So there is this spool and there's the usual tape path and we have um, one, two, three, four, five things. And here we also have, I guess, one, two, three, four, five things. Um, and there is the chad holder right over here. And indeed, this is the chad holder. So this is very similar, which, um, which is probably a good thing because it means that most likely the mechanisms and the circuitry are the same. Uh, here is a picture of that wobbly bit that I saw. Um, this is actually called a low tape arm. So there it is, the low tape arm. So this is nice uh, because it shows me all of the parts um, and it definitely should not be wobbling around like that, but at least we now know what this is. It's when the tape goes low, that micro switch gets hit and it basically says, oh, I can't punch anymore, or I can't perforate anymore. So that's useful. Um, and then there were circuit diagrams. So the thing that I need to do is pull the cards and take a look at the, uh, oops, that's upside down. Pull the cards and take a look at the chips that are on there um, and see if they correspond at all to uh, this thing. And also, when I was looking at some pictures of some of these, uh, these rollers were all straight. So I'm pretty sure that what must have happened is that this thing fell on this side. And this must have hit the floor, and this must have hit the floor, and this must have hit the floor as well, which isn't great. Take this off. Yes. Okay, and let's pull the card out. This card probably hasn't been out of this machine since it was first built. Yes, okay, here we have the card. Okay, so any markings on it? 111821, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so what have we got? We've got a couple of what appear to be driver transistors. There is an awful capacitor that is probably all the electrons have leaked out of it. Um, we have a couple of potentiometers, many test points, which are nice. A um, bunch of logic chips, 
And then this awful thing, which cracked. Uh, it looks like the, uh, the housing cracked, but it looks like the electrical connections are intact. So that's good. And it doesn't look like the board is cracked either. So this is probably electrically okay. Okay, now this is, this looks to be like some sort of a driver card because it has a lot of high power transistors in there, uh, 12, 15 of them, and an enormous uh, capacitor. And many of these fuses, uh, the fuses all look okay. Um, I'm going to test them to make sure that they are all okay. Uh, this appears to be a power supply and there is also a board inside as well. How about we open this up as well and take a look at it. Okay, I have removed the screws. Let's see. Oh wow, it's kind of a big big contraption. Okay, this is the enormous uh, beast of uh, whatever it is. I guess it's a power supply because uh, it has an enormous capacitor here. There's another enormous capacitor inside there. On this side is an enormous transformer. And here we have a whole bunch of test points with a whole bunch of voltages listed. So what I'm thinking is I could just power this up by itself. And I presume that this was the, pow the power switch. Um, and this probably supplies all the power. So what I could do is just power this up and test each of these points and see if uh, everything is okay. There are some chads. Maybe I'll just uh, take a vacuum cleaner to this first. And so I just plugged it back into the power switch. I didn't plug in the other thing. So hopefully the only thing that is connected is the power switch. So let's turn it on. Careful not to touch many things. Okay. This is 27.5 volts. Oh wow, okay, well, 34 volts. Maybe that's because it isn't loaded. Uh, this one says 35 volts, and it's 36. This is minus 12, just about minus 12. Here is plus 12, just about 12. And here is five volts. Well, that's a little over, 5.8 volts. But again, maybe that's because it's uh, loaded, it's not loaded down by anything, 5.8 volts. So I guess that's okay. Um, the, the reading on the 27.5 uh, is a little concerning because it is uh, quite high by something like, you know, 20 or 25%. And the 35 volt is just about on. So, I don't know uh, whether, again, it's because uh, this thing has, isn't loaded down. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug it in and uh, see if that loads the uh, power supply down. So let's uh, very carefully probe 27.5 volts. No, it's still 33, so that's a little high. Um, I don't know if there is any actual adjustment and it probably doesn't matter because it's maybe just a generic, you know, relatively high voltage power supply. So I removed this poor thing. It's uh, pretty bent. So it looks like it's just uh, a screw inside. So maybe I could just uh, very carefully bend it back 
course it may break because of metal fatigue, but if this is what I think it is, uh, all it is is a screw that goes all the way down. I can easily replace that. Okay, that's not too bad. It's straight and it rolls. Well, let me take the other one off now. And this one is going to be a little trickier to bend back because there is no length down here. It was just a small thing that fits right into the lever. So let's see. And no, it's not really possible to bend this back. Um, even just trying to clamp down on it will ruin the threads. Uh, I can just replace this and I've got this uh, thread checker here so I can see how big it is. And it looks like it is a uh, number 632. Well, this is also very nice. Um, at least with this model, it says that the perforator is bi-directional. You can actually backspace the tape up to 10 rows, which I guess makes sense that there's a limit because if you're punching the tape through here, uh, I think it goes through here and then out through this hole in the front panel. Um, and then into here, which can then, I guess, spool onto here. Anyway, um, you know, it, it kind of makes sense that you can only go backwards a certain amount because otherwise the tape will just get all raveled up in here. So, so that's one interesting thing. Um, the other interesting thing that I found are these operational modes. Um, and there's a tape feed and delete mode, which corresponds to the feed slash delete switch in front. Uh, and when you hit tape feed, uh, it will just move the tape forward at 75 characters per second while punching sprocket holes only in feed or all holes in delete. So what the delete button does is it effectively deletes the data on the tape by punching all of the holes, which is kind of uh, interesting. And actually, I don't think that I'm going to test this right now because these are the punching solenoids. And this board, I believe these fuses fuse each of the solenoids. So I don't want to activate these solenoids if there's like, you know, junk in the way or if they um, haven't been oiled or used in a while because it also says here um, punch head must be lubricated periodically. Well, this thing has certainly not been lubricated periodically, um, if at all, in the past decade maybe. So rather than actually try to feed tape through this, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll just take this apart and just do some basic maintenance on it um, and, then, and then maybe activate the solenoids by hand. Okay, logic cards are back in. And now let's take a look at this arm. Nothing, if I lift this, ah, yes. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, if this is actually punching tape, presumably this will rotate as well. Okay, so here are a few more notes. Uh, we have feed delete, and this is where I got the information that delete will actually just punch all of the holes. Uh, feed, there is a note that basically says that uh, you can't punch while you're uh, feeding it, which kind of makes sense. Uh, here's that perf status uh, lamp, and it basically says that uh, the tape supply is nearly exhausted. Uh, or the optional CHAD detector goes off, and I don't think there is a CHAD detector on this. So again, if I turn this on, okay, and I move this uh, low tape arm so that the switch goes off, uh-huh, yes, there we go. 
So that is also working. So it looks like all the mechanics of the motors are working. So really the only thing that's left is this thing, which I really don't trust to just turn on and work. Okay, and actually operating the thing using the signals is apparently very easy. You need to make sure that the punch is ready, the system is ready, uh, if there is a CHAD detector that it's not going off. Um, and then you need to apply the direction signal and then apply the data signals. And then finally, you uh, strobe the punch command and the tape will advance one row and punch a feed hole plus the data tracks. Uh, the feed hole is the, the middle sprocket thing. Um, and then you just repeat. So, you know, we can just basically punch one character at a time. So the next project is to uh, look at this and maybe uh, manually uh, get it going. And that will probably be the next video. So, okay, bye-bye, punch perforator thing. Rob tries to fix a thing.